Hello everybody. Today we're going to be talking about increased intracranial pressure. And just like my helpful slides for study tips and concept mapping, I'm going to split it up by what is it, how do we treat it, and what do we teach them. Okay, so we can pretty much do that with any kind of ailment, so we're going to do that with intracranial pressure as well. Okay, so what is increased intracranial pressure? Well, clearly, it's just the pressure in the skull. Right, so our skull is actually a rigid box, and it's made of blood, uh, brain, CSF, okay, and all of these things together form what they call the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. Okay, so if any one of those things creates an added pressure or goes up and down at all, the other ones have to um, kind of go up and down just to, to adjust to avoid increased intracranial pressure. Okay. So there's other things that do cause it, um, basically our blood flow, obviously, and CO2 actually helps with intracranial pressure. Okay. It can also increase in, um, increase in CO2 is going to cause a vasodilation, which is going to increase the intracranial pressure. If you have too little of CO2, you actually have a vasoconstriction, so that's also going to increase intracranial pressure. Okay, so it's all about that balance. You have to keep that good pH and a good level of CO2. So our normal level of ICP is going to be anywhere from 0 to 15. All right, 0 to 10 is really where we want it. Anything over 15, we're going to worry about pressure and worry about possible herniation. Okay, herniation is bad. We do not want herniation. Okay, so what does happen when we herniate brain? If we herniate brain tissue, it's basically that shifting in the brain tissue from too much edema. Okay, so it's going to have an increased blood flow into the brain. Your brain's going to move from side to side, back and forth, depending on where that brain tissue is being squeezed. Um, many times you'll see unequal pupils, okay, and you might see them larger on one side, smaller on the other, and they might switch depending on um, the amount of pressure in that, that cavity. And this is bad, and it will lead to patient's death. Okay, so herniating brain is never what we want. I have this slide up here because it's called Cushing's Triad. Anytime we have increased intracranial pressure, we can always try to um, keep that balance up, try to make sure that everything happens in our body that helps with com compensation, um, but sometimes we don't catch it in time or it's, you know, just something that you know, is always going to lead to being fatal. Okay, so this is the signs and symptoms that your increased intracranial pressure have gone too far. And that's bradycardia, bradypnea, and hypertension. Okay, again, all dead disease. Okay, increased pressure, decreased heart rate. Um, sometimes you'll see that chain Stokes. Right, and once you're in Cushing's triad, this is nine times out of ten fatal for your patient. Right, never ever ever a good sign. Okay. So how do we assess for intra um, increased intracranial pressure? Right? Besides our monitoring systems, there are going to be first signs of these. Right? And um, typically, you're always going to see a change in level of consciousness. So no matter what the age group, right, it's always going to be an alteration in LOC. But if you're a child, you might see projectile vomiting as one of those first symptoms. Okay? Versus adults, they might have a headache. All right? Um, they might vomit, but it will be a later. But every single age, children, adult, is always going to have an altered LOC in the early changes. Right? You might also see headaches, like I said, um, vomiting, especially in children. Right? You may even see some posturing, depending on if the brain has started to herniate or not. And you guys remember that decorticate and decerebrate posturing. Right? That decorticate is everything's pulled inside the core. So the arms will be contracted inwards, the toes will be pointed inwards, versus decerebrate when everything rolls outwards. Okay? Um, decorticate is usually worse prognosis-wise. Okay? Again, like I was talking about with the pupils, if we're having um, increased pressure, you're going to see some dilation, and you're probably going to see unequal pupils. Right? Um, they, again, might dilate on the side of the lesion, depending on if it's herniating or not. Um, they might both be dilated and they might switch places.
So what are some complications of increased intracranial pressure? Well, we can have different complications, and most of them are based on our um, antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so two of the things we really see are going to be SIADH and diabetes insipidus. So SIADH is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so basically, inappropriate antidiuretic hormone means we're going to have an increase of uh, secretion of antidiuretic hormone. So if we have increased amounts of not being able to pee, you're going to see um, low to no urinary output as one of those symptoms of SIADH. Okay. Versus in diabetes insipidus, you actually have a decreased level of um, ADH going through the body. And then you're going to see a large, large amount of clear urine. Um, talking like clear, 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 looks like water type urine. Right. Um, and these are complications of ICP or increased intracranial pressure. And sometimes complications if that person's had a craniotomy or um, ventriculostomy. Or, sorry, ventriculos? Ugh. Yeah, I said that right. <laughs> ventriculostomy. Um, so, yep. All right, so next step. Now you have to, how to assess it. How do I know that they're getting increased intracranial pressure? But what are we going to do about it? All right, so remember in the treatments, we have medical treatment versus um, nursing interventions. Right? So basically for nurses, it's going to be safety. All right? We have to provide the basic needs. All right? We always have to make sure the airway is going to be clear. Um, most of these people are probably going to be on your ICUs and intubated. Right? We're going to definitely watch out for skin. Right? Um, if they're in bed for too long, we're going to do that two-hour turning and padding and lotion and all that for basic skin care. Um, mouth care is super important. You guys remember from the, uh, talking about pneumonia, oral care is the number one way to keep that away. So we're definitely going to do oral care for these patients. Um, I do want to talk about temperature a little bit. Okay, so sometimes when you see these patients with increased intracranial pressure, you might see what's called a central temperature or a, um, a CNS temp. Okay, um, and these temperatures can be like 104 to 106 um, degrees Fahrenheit. And it's kind of scary to see because that should be in the dead range. Um, but because it is not actually like a systemic issue, it's coming from the nervous system, um, it's pretty common with these types of patients. Okay, so we're probably going to have something that's monitoring that temperature um, and maybe even some cooling blankets. Right? Position is a huge, huge um, safety for nursing treatments for increased intracranial pressure. And the appropriate position for these people are going to be a neutral position for the head. Right? You want to keep the head of the bed elevated um, at most to 60. Okay? You can even do it flat if needed. Um, but if you want to elevate it to kind of promote some venous drainage, that would be good. We're not going to avoid... Uh, sorry, we're going to avoid hip flexion at all possible. Um, we're going to avoid valsalva maneuvers, uh, having abdominal distension, okay, because all of these are going to increase the pressure. So if we bend the legs, pressure goes up. If the patient needs to void in cants, we're going to put in that catheter so we don't have that abdominal pressure. Right? The environment's going to be calm and quiet um, because ICP is it can vary from second to second. So, I mean, People have told stories of, you know, their spouse comes in and talks to them, their pressure goes up. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's very easy <laughs> to go up and down. Right? We're also going to protect their eyes. Um, like I said, a lot of them are ventilated and intubated. Um, so we want to make sure that they're lubricated. Okay. For medical treatment, right? you might see um, a medication that we call mannitol. Okay, so this medication is um, definitely one of the most popular ones that the doctors will use in order to pull out um, the inflammation from the brain. It's pretty, pretty common still. Um, I don't know. You don't see it that much anymore, but that's pretty much the go-to drug for pulling down um, inflammation. So you might hear that. 
when we do look at ICP as far as treatment, we also want to think about measuring cerebral perfusion pressure, okay, so our CPP. So cerebral perfusion pressure is going to basically be our blood flow to the brain. Okay? We can't have life unless we have blood flow to the brain. Okay? So the way we um, calculate our central perfusion, or sorry, cerebral perfusion pressure is by getting our MAP, okay, mean arterial pressure, minus the ICP. Okay? So our goal cerebral perfusion pressure is going to be 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Okay? So the ICP should be less than 20. Right. Um, so, for example, we have a map of 60 and an ICP of 10, right? So 60 minus 10, obviously it's going to be 50, all right? So, goal cer cerebral perfusion pressure to make sure we have ad adequate blood flow is going to be 60 to 70 um, or greater. ICP has to be less than that 20. So how do we treat it again medically? If we have um, outside of our mannitol, we can have some different procedures. Right? So the first is going to be your ventriculostomy. This is going to help monitor intracranial pressure, but it also has that added extra of draining CSF and blood out of the brain cavity. Um, it's going to be very easy to use. Based on position of your patient, you're actually going to have that transducer. And you're excuse me, going to line it up to just above the tragus. Okay, so depending on um, if your patient's head of the bed is elevated or not, you might have to re-level that machine. Okay, so it is a closed system, it's a sterile system, and it helps bring down that pressure um, by draining some of that extra CSF. Okay. They can be put in different places. Um, these ones are going to go inside the ventricles. Right, and again, this is usually that gold standard. So this is just a little more about it. You have that fine bore catheter that goes into the ventricle, and usually on the non-dominant hemisphere. The next surgical option, we can have a craniotomy. Right? So this is when they actually go in and remove parts of the brain. Um, they might take out part of that herniation. And very, very commonly after that craniotomy, that's when you start to see that diabetes insipidus that we talked about a few minutes ago. Okay. So this is an opening in skull that helps to remove tumors, clots, um, we can control bleeding, and again, relieve some of that pressure. This is a picture of some of the monitoring devices. Right? So we can put our ICP monitor in there, it actually just monitors the pressure. Um, you can see some of those subarachnoid screws, uh, the bolts, Okay, all of these are different monitoring devices, um, different locations. But for all of them, remember we have to keep that head in that neutral position and make sure we um, kind of minimize our nursing care, or kind of cluster care. So again, how do we treat it? Post-op management, right? We're going to want to reduce the cerebral edema. So this is where that uh, mannitol comes in that I was talking about. Okay, this mannitol is going to be that osmotic diuretic. And this helps to dehydrate the brain tissue. Okay, so it's going to reduce some of that edema, um, draw the water from the brain um, into, or sorry, to reduce the volume in the extracellular fluid. Okay, so mannitol, again, osmotic diuretic, that's going to help reduce the cerebral edema. Um, sometimes you can see some corticosteroids being used, but this is typically if the edema is formed from a tumor. Um, they Always, uh, I don't want to say always, they sometimes can use like a barbiturate. This kind of help prevent seizures um, and then it reduces the demand um, on the, or sorry, reduces the metabolic demands. Okay, so again, helping to reduce some of that pressure because we're preventing um, seizures and demands. Okay, um, every once in a while, well, if these people are on ICP monitoring, most likely they're going to have some hemodynamic instability as well. Okay, so you might see meds like tubutamine, uh, norepinephrine, again, just to help kind of increase that cardiac output and increase the perfusion to the brain. Okay. 
So finally, what do we teach them? Right? What can we teach someone post-op after like a craniotomy or ventriculostomy? Um, really, most of these patients are you know, trauma patients, sepsis patients, cancers. Um, there's really not a whole lot to teach them. You're going to teach them general care of the wound if they need staples removed, sutures, uh, monitor for signs and symptoms of infection in that site. So redness, puffy, pussy, you know, painful, right? So they should um, follow up with their doctor after that. Safety concerns, again, if it was a trauma, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's hard to kind of prevent those, but we can do our, our normal primary prevention of like seatbelts, um, helmets, just basic things like that. There's not a whole lot of um, education that can really go into this and except for, you know, saying like, oh, don't have an accident, you know, so... Some of these patients will end up in rehab, uh, depending on the size of herniation or the, the accident they might have gone through. They may need some occupational therapy, um, even some you know speech therapy, again, depending on where in the brain that uh, was affecting. Okay. But that is increased intracranial pressure.